All right, everybody, welcome back. This is part two of our discussion on Canada, specifically talking about French exploration to the War of 1812. We're talking about Canadian colonial society. So what you're going to expect to see over the duration of this next 15-minute lecture is we're going to start off talking about the establishment of this new colonial settlement that is called New France in the Quebec area. We're going to talk about the French-Canadian society specifically the seigneurial system and also fur trading. We're even going to talk about this event called the Seven Years' War in the French, which would later be called the French and Indian War, that would ultimately spark a turning point for French colonial society and also the British colonial society. We're also going to talk about the French contact specifically with the English on the eve of the American Revolution and also how the American Revolution itself, yes, I know we have not talked about it yet, but caused ripples not just within english society but also french colonial society so with that there's a couple things i want you guys to remember you got your essential questions how did european colonization affect the indigenous populations of the americas and also how did colonial institutions form and what led to resistance towards these de facto governments all right so So we're going to jump in. We're going to talk about New France, this new colonial settlement that is being established within the Canadian region um, of North America. So to talk about a little bit of the religious presence, we're going to see that the first Jesuits arrived in 1625 and uh, they saw this as an opportunity to convert the natives. And they were heavily supported by the French crown and also the new the established new French authorities but after 1665 we see a renewed interest in mercantilist potential of this region of new france so it wasn't just this idea this opportunity to convert the native population uh, but also this renewed interest in trade and also this increased economic viability that the region could uh, provide for the greater french um, economy we're also going to see that a lot of this economy is going to start to thrive off of the trade of fur, specifically um, within the region of New France, and how this itself is basically providing viability for colonial establishments to form within the area. And with this influx of European fur traders, we're also seeing this influx um, of French laws, traditions, and also religion that is starting to kind of seep its way into this region of the world and eventually try to take root in terms of these French colonial uh, establishments. And what we're going to start to see is as these colonial settlements are become established, we're going to see the establishment of the seigneurial system roughly around the year 1627. And initially, this was a system that started as land distribution and which was kind of um, established by the royalty system that was primarily focused on getting people to farm subsistently, meaning that they were meeting their needs. They weren't necessarily meeting, um, trying to farm or use the land for profit, but simply to just establish and keep them established as a society, keep their needs met, keep their families fed, um, basically just providing for their own basic needs. But we're, what we're gonna start to see is that as this system starts to grow, as the new France area starts to take hold, it starts to regain a purpose to promote settlement. Um, and what we will also see is that it's gonna pr promote a pretty divisive social structure similar to that that we saw um, that we see in the estates in France during this time and shortly after um, where you have the seigneurial, the landowner up at the top and typically the, um, the tenant farmer down more at the bottom. In addition to French establishment of colonial 
settlements in the area. We are, are also going to talk about the fee de roi. That is a term that's often used to refer to this kind of natural population growth within the area. But really what it is, is it's forced migration by, at the request of the king in, in terms of trying to create an influx of a female population within to the region because primarily the settlements were had consisted of men but naturally if they wanted to grow the population you needed both parties to do so so what we see is that this uh, program is sponsored by king louis the 14th of france that is really trying to just for almost forcefully migrate some of the female population, roughly 800 young French women, to New France to boost the population within the region and also solidify population uh, control and growth specifically within this region. And we also have an understanding that British um, colonial societies are starting to take root within Canada as well. We're going to see that the British colonized the region south of New France, and they saw this New France's success in fur trapping and trading as a way to also grow their economy. So you start to see this kind of conflict and tensions rise between both French colonial settlers and also European settlers, ultimately leading us to what would be called the uh, Seven Years' War or later the French and the French and Indian War, or later called the Seven Years' War. All right, so now that we're, we have this kind of understanding of the British initial involvement within Canada, what we're also going to see is that this um, hostility between the French colonial society and the British colonial society is coming to a pass during the Seven Years' War, which would also be referred to as the French and Indian War. Um, at its outset. So beginning in 1754, uh, Great Britain is fighting for control of Canadian territory and also that fur trade that we had discussed earlier in this lecture. Um, and basically it was a Great Britain and the Iroquois Indians versus the French and the Huron Indians. Um, so that kind of gives us what we commonly refer to as the French and Indian War. Um, but basically it was a dispute over land claims in the Ohio Valley and ultimately led to war between Great Britain and France. Uh, but what we're also going to see is as it moves on, it's slowly beginning to become a larger conflict. That is why it is starting to become known as the Seven Years' War. Ultimately, Great Britain is going to become victorious roughly uh, in 1754, and they force France to sign a treaty. Um, Treaty of Paris in 1763, which would ultimately result in significant land increase for Great Britain in the uh, Canadian area, as we know it today, and a significant decrease in territory for the French, which leads us to what is called the Quebec Act in 1774. And basically what we see is that leading up to the American Revolution, because at in 1774, we are at the almost the eve of the American Revolution. Many American co colonial loyalists, um, that is people that are loyal to Great Britain, uh, fled to Canada in the buildup of the American Revolution and did not want to live among the French-speaking Canadians. There was a vast cultural difference between the English and French. Uh, there's language barriers. And in general, now with Great Britain having some sort of almost dominance within the area, the British started to move quick in terms of um, trying to create some sort of distance between Great Britain and the French. So Great Britain in this area that was now controlled by them allowed the French to kind of reside in Quebec, but continue to control the region. But the key thing to remember here is that they did not necessarily want to keep these hostilities going. So Britain allowed them to maintain their culture. They allowed them to stay in Quebec, uh, but they did still ultimately remain the uh, authority in the region. So it gave French Canadians Quebec the right to continue practicing the Catholic religion and allowed for French civil law. But loyalists were here. It became irritated with this new political and cultural power of the French um, and 
ultimately the differences among the two groups eventually led to a redivision of the country which leads us to the american revolution and you might be saying whoa the, this seems pretty quick chill it seems like we got here really fast well we kind of did um but what we need to kind of do is we'll, we'll, we're going to fill in some of these gaps in terms of the american revolution from the united states perspective uh don't worry but spoiler alert uh come out victorious in that effort which leads us to how we know canada um in terms of today's society so what we're going to see in post american revolution uh society within the region of canada is that between 1776 and 1867 colonies of modern canada um become commonly known as british north america and the British question their attitude towards democracy and the colonies, having learned the folly of heavy taxes, too much democracy and economic development and how that can play out. Uh, so what now for the Brits in Canada following the revolution? Uh, and this is going to lead us to a video that I'm going to use to help explain the Constitutional Act of 1791. So as we go through this next five minute video. What I'd like you to take notes on is to keep in mind um, the relationship between the French and the British and also uh, the British's, Great Britain's role within this region of society while also understanding the logistics of um, British society and French society within this region. So without further ado, let's take a look at how this um, interpretation of the Constitutional Act of 1791 plays out. The Constitutional Act of 1791, the government structure which resulted from the Constitution Act and the development of towns. So if we remember after the American Revolution, when the Loyalists uh, come up to Canada, they had to settle to the west of what the area that was known as Quebec. And there was some unrest, they were not happy. So one of the things that happens around this time period is they decide to establish two separate areas. And they establish uh, Upper Canada and Lower Canada. I know it seems kind of silly because Upper Canada is actually lower than um, Lower Canada. If you think about it from coming from... Uh, from colonization and coming from Britain, this is the lower portion and this is the upper portion. That's how I try to remember. Uh, so this was, again, predominantly French speaking, and this is predominantly the new loyalists who have arrived after the American Revolution. <clears throat> so the Constitution Act of 1791 was in response to the British loyalists wanting a government. They were used to the organization of the government in 13 colonies and having a voice and they didn't like how the people in Canada didn't participate in their government. And so to satisfy both sides, the British government establishes the Constitution Act of 1791. So some of the things that are outlined in this act are, Upper Canada and Lower Canada will both receive their own legislative assembly. So the governments will be separate. Upper Canada will have its own, Lower Canada will have its own. And both will have a legislative assembly, which will be elected by the free men of those two areas. There will be a governor general who represents the king. They will be appointed by the king. And the governor general will reside in Lower Canada. And the governor general has all the power. There will be a lieutenant governor who is the head of the government in Upper Canada, but the governor general is a step above him and he will have the most power. So the governor general in Lower Canada uh, is in complete control. Both colonies will have an executive council and a legislative council. Those are appointed by the British government. And then both colonies will elect a legislative assembly and they'll be in charge of taxes and they'll propose bills and sort of the local needs. Now, it was sort of a, it was kind of a trick, because even though they gave them this legislative assembly and they told them they had you know, some role in the government, they had really limited power. All the power really resided with the executive council, uh, legislative council, and the governor general. <clears throat> here is uh, the structure of the government. Now, I've put up here, it's the government in Upper Canada. So remember, Upper Canada is that portion of the British loyalists who have the lieutenant governor, who's second in charge, the governor general. The governor general is in 
uh, Lower Canada, and he is the person that's truly in charge. So we have the British government over in Great Britain, and they appoint, the green, the green arrows are appoint, they appoint a lieutenant governor uh, for Upper Canada. The Executive Council and the Legislative Council are also appointed, and sometimes they're appointed by members of the British government, but, and sometimes the, the governors have some influence in who they are. Once you're in the Legislative Council, you're there for life. When you're in the Executive Council, you're there until the Lieutenant Governor says that they don't want you anymore. And it's sort of for obvious reasons, because the job of the Executive Council is to advise the Governor. So if the Governor doesn't like what you're doing, they just kick you off the Council and appoint somebody else. The Legislative Council's job was related to bills and laws, and they would propose them, they would approve them if they were proposed by the Legislative Assembly. That was their role. The Lieutenant Governor's job, they represented the British government, and they did their best to uphold those laws and the British way of life. Now, from the bottom, the voters, so any free men who owned property, could vote for a representative in the Legislative Assembly. So the men that were in the Legislative Assembly were voted for by the people of Upper Canada or Lower Canada to represent them within this government. And again, they were involved with deciding about taxes and how that money would be spent. And they would propose bills for the Legislative Council to uh, think about and decide whether or not they were going to pass. And they were involved with local needs and local concerns. You can see how it's organized. <clears throat> so the Constitutional Act of 1791 sort of made everybody happy and it was a time where you know we we got over the conflict the French and the British were going to live together the 13 colonies the American Revolution had happened they were dealing with their independence and and expanding and things at this time and so it was time for Lower Canada and Upper Canada to do the same so emergence of towns happened with their own separate governments they felt empowered and they felt that they could really make decisions and that they could start to develop and expand their communities so they started to establish cores and schools and hospitals and things like that. Uh, and so those institutional buildings. They also started to create a capital building in Upper and Lower Canada. And it was a time of union and it was a time of growth. So it was a time where cultures that are very different and had we've been trying to have biculturalism for so long, truly were able to live side by side in harmony. <laughs> thing that I would like to kind of end this lecture on for today is to kind of take a look at the comparison between uh, the two regions, um, both the British uh, colonies within North America and also the, the French territory in North America as well, and also kind of understanding this kind of division between Upper and Lower Canada. So for comparison, just take a, a quick second to look over and glance this map. We're kind of seeing this territorial growth in terms of the colonial period in 1775 and then what we will see from 1790 to 1920 in terms of territorial expansion um, within the region. And for comparison, we see this difference in terms of territorial um, I guess, power between the French, the, um, the American or the United States, the Danish and the Spanish. Um, and what we're kind of seeing is this clear division between, um, especially in this last slide, this clear division between Upper Canada and Lower Canada. And we're going to see this clear difference between um, social, social structure too, in terms of the, the family compact in Upper Canada and the Chateau clique um in lower canada so in upper canada the family compact is kind of representative of a small group of men who exercise most of the political economic and judicial power um within upper canada which is modern day Ontario, ontario from the 1810s to the 1840s and it was um basically the kind of equivalent to what we're going to talk about next that is the chateau click um in lower canada it was primarily a conservative uh, base and they had a strong opposition to democracy in this region and in lower Canada we see that it's a primarily a group of wealthy families in lower Canada within the early 19th century that wanted um, a French Canadian majority uh, of lower Canada to assimilate to English culture as along with the abolition of the seign seignorial 
system. They wanted to replace French civil law with British common law. They also wanted the typo replace the established Roman Catholic Church with the Anglican Church. Ultimately, what we're going to see is that this is going to bring up to bring us up to speed with the next time that we try to use Canada as a comparison tool uh, for this region that is the broader Americas when we get to the Act of Union because the Chateau Click and the their efforts are going to lead to the Act of Union of 1840, which ultimately um, will fail in its attempt to assimilate all French Canadians, but succeeded in preventing their political and economic interests from prevailing over those from Britain. Uh, needless to say, what we're seeing in all of this is a, a clear division between French and, and British interests within the region of Canada and this clear division and hostility between the two groups as well. And it kind of characterizes this understanding of how these colonial institutions are forming and also what led to resistance towards these governments. So in sum, I think it would be a good idea for you guys to take maybe three to four minutes to come to some sort of a conclusion, some sort of summary to try to answer those essential questions come away from a broader overview of what we are using Canada in terms of as a comparison tool and also um, now would probably be a good time you're going to see a, a pop-up right now talking about the um, that's going to give you a link to go kind of go back to, if you need to the first part of this lecture series for Canada and it might be interesting for you to maybe go back to the other um, aspects of maybe Spain or English colonial societies and those video lectures as well in terms of trying to come to a greater understanding of how all of these colonial systems kind of work together and how they don't really work together with their similarities, with their differences. So having said that, uh, that's going to conclude us for today and this video lecture and ultimately this video lecture series on colonialism in the Americas. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button and we'll see you next time.